I went out, I walked out the hallway and that hallway was so long and I was like, if God allow me to make it down this hallway to this elevator out of this apartment, I can make it. Because the hardest thing to do is to walk down that hall. Mm -hmm. That hallway was spinning around. Yeah. I made it to the elevator and I made it to the car. I got to the airport and I asked the Dallas police officer, I said, hey, listen, I said, my son just died. I'm confused. I don't mm -hmm. know where I am. Wow. I felt like I was about to pass out. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Brandi Harvey. I'm so excited that you have decided to join us for Vault and Powers Talks. This one is going to be a good one. I feel a viral moment coming on, y'all. I'm so excited to talk to my cousin. This is my cousin today. You better believe it. You better this let is my know. cousin you better let know. that I have not seen in 20 <laughs> years. I have not seen this man in person since like 03. Since you crossed Delta. And you was in the parking lot <laughs> setting it out in 2003 in Los Angeles, California. I said, look at the twins, look at the Sarah. That's Come so on, right. So I am so excited. <laughs> Actor, comedian, national syndicated radio show host, reality TV star, cooking show star, <laughs> philanthropist, HBCU alumni, and a member of Omega Psi Brandon, Five. You gonna read that obituary? Obituary, baby. <laughs> Listen, so we gonna lay this man to rest. Welcome to the show, Ricky Smiley. How are you? Thank you. I, Come on, you ready? Yeah. That's it. We had to do it. We had to do it. We had to do I, it. I, 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 I. <laughs> What's up, cousin? I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. You Listen, know I wasn't gonna say no to you. You cannot say no. And I look, I have been looking forward to this conversation for months. Good. I have been looking forward to this. And I feel like we had a whole interview off camera yeah. before we even started. Oh yeah. It's it's like when family, when family get together, when family connect, we just catching up. Yeah. Or whatever. Cause it's like we cousins for real. We <laughs> we've been knowing each other for years. We years. grew up. Yes. You know, so yes. uh, under the same values yeah. and, and stuff so you know uh being mentored by your dad and, yeah. and so we we come from the same yeah you know from the same tribe for real we are in the same tribe and you drove in from birmingham I today did. we didn't have no soul food for this man y'all chipotle didn't. i'm like yo <laughs> then got it then got in there laid in that buffet style in them little plastic to go containers y'all wrong for that Boy, please. I'm like, y'all gonna go get me some, somebody send somebody to Busy Bees. He said, and give me I some don't smoke, want some, that. some turkey wings and some dressing and some greens. <laughs> he said, I don't want you that. You come to Atlanta, you gotta eat. Well, now we know. Yeah. So, look, so afterwards, we're going to get soul food, y'all. Okay, yeah, busy just know bees. that. Just know I'm jumping in the sprinter and I'm going to get soul food. Yeah. All right. So, we come from the same tribe. You mm -hmm. know, I have done all my research on you. You yeah. know, apparently. <laughs> I'm shocked that you know some of the stuff that you know. I know all the tea. I got all the stuff. But, you know, really what stood out to me most is you have such a love and admiration for my dad. And oh, yeah. I really, really, really love that. Because you mm -hmm. tell a great story about yeah. how he made you put on a suit. You said you put on a suit today. I was not. I, was, I had something casual. And then I, I, when I found out it was you, <clears throat> anything with, with y'all last name and y'all brand, <laughs> You should have saw me in that closet going, shh, shh. <laughs> Bro, I went and I, I said, I got to put on the suit. And, I, you, and know, you, I, you Easter sharp. You looking oh, yeah. good. I, try, I had, you know, I, I made sure my ankles and stuff wasn't you ashy. You did. Because Steve, funny acting, because if, if you ashy, he'll like avoid you like for a, a couple yeah. of weeks yeah. just because you was ashy. Yeah. So I had to get it together. I had to yeah. make sure everything was on point. You did. And so, you, you rose you. to the occasion. Yeah. And look at you. You shining too. Now. I mean, you know, I put I on see. my glow. We was talking about my yeah. glow now. And, and then I put on some armor all on my ankles. I put a little bit there too. Right. We had shared it in the bag. Right. See, when black people put armor all on the tire, we don't wipe it down. We just let it dry. Let it dry. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. So you have been putting on suits for 30 years because mm -hmm. you got told by my dad yeah. that I'm going to let you introduce me tonight. Mm hmm but tomorrow you need to put a suit on. These people pay good money to come see you. I had on a, I'm a, uh, I collect Nike. Yeah. And I had on a brand new Nike jogging suit. It was fresh. It had a hat to the back. Yeah. And Steve was looking at me like, uh, you can introduce me tonight, but tomorrow I need for you to wear a suit because people pay money to see us perform. And I introduced him and I ran out of that comedy club and jumped in my car and peeled out of that parking lot. Went all the way across town, yeah. put on a suit right quick. And by the time I made it back to the comedy club, 
he was saying, thank y'all, my name's Steve Harvey, good night. And I came back on stage with a suit on. And he looked me up and down, he was like, yeah. You serious? He was like, you serious? Yeah. I said, oh yeah. Yeah, not tomorrow, right now. Today. Yes, sir. Yeah. I feel like that's that's that <clears throat> old school mentality though. Discipline, right? Yeah. It's just, it's just discipline and structure and uh, accepting correction. Uh, the problem in society today, you can't correct. Yeah. Right? Braces correct the smile, but they hurt. Yeah. But they correct the smile, though. Yeah. Braces are inconvenient. Braces, food get in the braces. They hurt. They irritate the hell out of you. But when you smile, hmm. and now everybody teeth is cricket because <laughs> you cannot correct. Yeah. You can't say nothing to nobody anymore. And that's why a lot of people are where they are because there's no guidance, there's no discipline, no structure, no correction. Uh, your dad uh, took about four of us back to the hotel room one night. I never shared this story. Uh, I, I forgot about it. I never shared this with anybody. And uh, it was a little cheap hotel like the Holiday Inn. Uh, I think it was maybe like the Marriott or the Hilton or whatever. Yeah. We sat on the edge of the bed and he stood up and, and turned the TV off and turned the lights on and lectured us about comedy. <laughs> and I, I, bought, I got a notepad. The little, you know the little notepad from the, the from the hotel yeah i was sitting up there like a student i was sitting yeah. on edge. i was getting those yeah. notes because i saw how the audience responded to him and i wanted that for myself and i wanted to know how to do that and i wrote all that stuff down and i mean he talked to us for like a couple of hours it was it was 2 30 3 o'clock in the morning and i'm sitting up there because he had did a midnight show hmm. right so i'm sitting there sleepy as hell I can't go to sleep while this man talking. It's like like Pledge and Q. You can't go to sleep online. You cannot. You better not nod You off. You learn sleep deprivation. You better, yeah. you better not nod yeah. off. And I'm sitting up here and I took those notes. And I just remember like, wow. Wow. You know, I'm just so excited about the information. I was inspired. I was, um, I wanted to make something happen. I was like, okay, let's do this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but that's um, one of the comedians with the most influence that took interest in, in me and my yeah. career. I love how you said he brought you on stage after you with the suit. You went home, got the suit. Mm -hmm. He brings you back on stage. Oh, that was the Kings of Comedy. That was at the Kings of Comedy. So, I opened up, so uh, he came to Birmingham to do the Kings of Comedy. Walter Lathan was, and he came to the radio station, did an interview. I was on 95.7 Jams, and he said, hey, I got something for y'all. I'm adding Ricky Smiley to the show tonight. And I'm sitting up there like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm a little, you're going to open up for the Kings of Comedy. I wow. was like, what? Yeah. So I was I had visitation weekend with my son, uh, Brandon, rest in peace. So I had to get off the air. I had to drive all the way to Atlanta and pick up my son. You were son. in Birmingham. I was in Birmingham. You go to Atlanta. Come all the way to Atlanta, uh, pick up my son, go all the way back in Birmingham, went to a place and got a suit. I had a salmon suit. <laughs> salmon, salmon like, like I had on I had on a a, a Bishop T.D. Jakes <laughs> Mahi Mahi <laughs> you had the gators on too uh, what the gate the square the toe the, the squ square square toe I'm talking about like like boom the one boomerang got. Boo -oh, baby he got a whole closet full of them shout out to boomerang <laughs> yes sir I had I had my gators on and I had some salmon socks I was clean. I was you clean. You was Easter shirt. You was casket a, shirt. A new napkin. I mean. Come on now. Board of health. I mean, wipe me down. What? Mm -hmm. Killed him. And I had my son with me. And I'm sitting right there in a the little area like this. And there's D.L. Hughley, Bernie Mac, Sid, Steve. And I'm sitting here with my son. And my son, we sharing a chair. <laughs> He's sitting on the edge of the chair. Brandon had to be about eight years old at the mm -hmm. time. And we sitting backstage. And I'm looking like. Like, wow, I'm really opening up for the Kings of Comedy. So I went out and did my three minutes, and then my job was to introduce Steve. Mm. And when I introduced Steve, the audience was going crazy because wasn't nobody really laughing at me because I'm the opening act, so I'm not getting the same <laughs> lights and sound. Yeah. So when I open up, it's all, the, all of a sudden the music comes on and everything, and Steve come out, you know. Mm, 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 <laughs> he got the hands. Mm, mm, you got to mm, do the hands. <laughs> You know, you know, right, right, right. That's it. Right, that's it. And he said, "Cut the music, cut the music." He said, "Come here, come here, Rick." And I came back out. He said, "Hey, I'm gonna let y'all know right now, just the next one. Hmm. You need to be proud of your own, Ricky Smiley." And uh, I, I, um, yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> Cause he didn't have to do that. And I remember going outside. I went to the bathroom. I just cried. Yeah. I had to share dressing rooms with him. Hmm. And I went to the bathroom. I just cried because I was just so thankful for that. Uh, somebody to, uh, that was the first time somebody just really acknowledged my talent. Yeah. And uh, 
And he said, don't worry about it, Ricky. He said, we're going to put you on some more shows. And um, I had a chance to do a few of those Kings of Comedy dates. And I'm wow. grateful for it. Yeah. And it actually changed my life. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that um, <clears throat> you know, because people don't have to do that. They could just introduce you. Yeah. But he says, stop. The music, because yeah. that it was his time. That was his moment. His moment. When you come being out. when you yeah. being introduced and the music going, yeah. that's your moment. That's your introduction, yeah. and to cut your introduction in half to share that with me. That's big. It's big. But that and, speaks and it, to you. It, yeah, it's almost like uh, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, anointed Malcolm, Malcolm X, Malcolm, yeah, and 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 and, and introduced him like this is my son, yeah, like. like or whatever uh so it kind of felt spiritual yeah. like that and uh and and i had a great career yeah you've yeah. had a wonderful career 30 years making people laugh 33 33 mm -hmm. consistent ticket sales selling mm -hmm. out yeah well over the last 25 years selling mm -hmm. out shows what is it to be consistent to have longevity to grow an audience everybody's talking about social media grow your audience all this stuff but mm -hmm. what was it then that you had that was different yeah we didn't have social media then uh my comedy back then was like really clean uh really uh christian based you said you was one stand <laughs> microphone you was yeah. doing the white comedy club so uh -huh. you had a yeah uh -huh. yeah you know doing uh just doing it the right way being professional and people like that because um a lot of comics i'm not knocking anybody but it was a lot of cursing that, uh and it was like uh, when Deaf Comedy Jam came out, the language yeah. kind of really got even stronger. Yeah. And I just stayed away from it. And I just went in this direction. And um, it worked for me. Yeah. It really worked for me. Um, I got I used to do mega churches and, and different. So I was able to perform at a church and perform at a comedy club. Yeah. You know, so uh, keeping it clean and just trying to do um uh, do it the right way, the way I was taught. Uh, your dad had got at me a, a couple of times for my language. You don't need that curse. He said, if that word is not part of the joke, if that word is not helping the punchline, then why use it? And that made a lot of sense. He said, let's write your jokes out word for word. It made me write it down. Were you writing your jokes at that time? Yeah, I was writing the jokes at the time, but I also had to write them down word for word. Now I can just do a a, a reference mm -hmm. or um, a, a talking point, but you back then you were taught to write your work jokes down word for word, and if that curse word do, does it is it needed? Mm -hmm. is, does it help that joke? Does it make that joke funnier? Okay, no. Okay, exit out. Now say it without the curse word. Yeah. Like we had that kind of training back then. Comedians, um, your dad, Carl Strong, uh, George Wallace, uh, they would sit you down and help you. Yeah, you know, uh, I I used to have to drive comics around because the, the the opening act used to have to pick up the headliner from the airport and we go from city to city. Really, and it was in your car, so I used to open for Rita Rita Rutner and and all those comics, and and they was riding in the car with you, and you get so much knowledge and information driving in a '79 Cutlass driving up in the hills of West Virginia. Charleston, West Virginia, Bridgeport, West Virginia, driving up in the mountains yeah. in a freaking Cutlass, 79, <laughs> two door. You got to slam the door real hard. You know, that's where the dance comes. Mm. <laughs> that's it. That's it's what they call slamming the Cutlass slamming door. Slamming the Cutlass door. Yeah. That's why young Jock, young Jock had a Cutlass. <laughs> Meet me in the train. He's like, oh, it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of that. <laughs> Look at everybody back here trying not to laugh. Y'all can laugh. I don't care. <laughs> That comes from slamming the cutlass door. That's real tough. As you you can you can ask TK Kirkland about that. Uh, I had to drive TK Kirkland around. <laughs> he was the headliner when you were. He was the headliner. We were TK driving Kirkland. through South Carolina from we went from Charlotte, North Carolina to South Carolina. TK had a couple of chicks. I was like the Christian guy. He, TK was a pimp back then, but we was all in the cutters and the AC didn't work, and it was in South Carolina. And we was on the road and it was hot, and TK trying to slam. <laughs> Slam that door. If you ever see TK Kirkland, ask him about slamming the door. Uh, that was a that was a laugh all the way from Charlotte to Columbia, and from Columbia to Atlanta, and then we had to drive to Memphis. Real talk. Wow. <laughs> I mean, most people don't even understand that type of grind. 
Mm-hmm. When you talk about driving all around the country, you even told the story I was listening and doing my research with you. That seventy nine colors got a lot of got a lot of play. Yeah. A lot of people rode in that car. Cedric the Entertainer rode in that car he down Peachtree, coming up with Lil Daryl. We were staying at the Marriott on Fourteenth Street. It's still there at the Marriott Suites. Okay. Right. Yes. And we went down to Peachtree to make a left to go down Peachtree, uh, and right where that Chick Fil A is on your right. Yep. That's what said. Uh, Because it was raining and we was doing Uptown Comedy Corner. It was right behind Houston. But that was the opening night. That was a Friday night. Mm. And Sid and I opened that club up. We were the first two comedians to ever perform on that stage. I was the opening act. And then it was said it was not even a middle act. And it was about 15, 16 people in the audience because the club was brand new. That was the opening night. Mm. Nobody knew. And we had a few more people that Saturday. Uh, uh, Sid uh, was like, man, that little. I said, hey, I got a character. Uh, or whatever, uh, and it's true because uh, uh, the gentleman uh, go, you know, go went to my my home church. Yeah, see, it said Little Daryl, and uh, when he says Easter speech, you got to say my name, Little Daryl, and then you got to turn around and go leave me alone, <laughs> and then and then my name, Little Daryl, and his grandma said like help me. I had like a lot of it, but said help me like really put that baby together. Yeah, he said you do that on stage. He said you gonna strike gold. I said okay. So you did it that night. I tried it that night, and uh, and uh, it was when I did it on BET Comic View. Was when it hit. That's when it blew up. Yeah. And I mean, it blew up. I went out to LA, take BET Comic View. Cat Williams was on that episode. Mike Epps was on that episode. Mike Epps wow. had on a Dallas Cowboy jersey. Cat Williams was then at the time Alley Cat. We were all on the same episode. Mike wow. said, "Just go out there." He said, "The audience had been sitting there all night. It was the same audience." Yeah. And um, I had my son, Brandon, Brandon was with me, and I, I did it at the end. Man, they was laughing so freaking hard. I got started getting excited. And I'm like, my name is down. I started <laughs> screaming in the mic or whatever. And I came off stage, man. I didn't know what happened. The comedians was running. The comedians had left their trailers. I remember Zoo Man, and uh, he came and he grabbed me. He picked me up. And all the comedians was going crazy. You would have thought that I threw the winning when touchdown pass. He was like, man, man, Zoo Man was like, man, your shit going to blow up, man. When this air, he said, man, you about to start getting booked. And he was right. The minute it aired, uh, every line that came out, for all Greek organizations that came out, it was a little Daryl on every line. What? Yeah. Uh, uh, people was getting ready to cross that spring. Uh, everybody had one dude online name was little Daryl. <laughs> Um, I went from staying at the Holiday Inn to a five star. I went, people started sending plane tickets. I, it, it wasn't no more driving to shows now. Wow. So I started getting plane tickets. Off a of little Daryl. Off a of little Daryl. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had an act because I had been performing for yeah. a while. So now I'm coming in headlining and I was giving good shows. Little Daryl was just a, um, and I would have to do little Daryl up front to get it out of the way. Just to get it out of the way so I can do the rest of my jokes. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I was putting on good shows. I would uh, I would go on with Mike Roberts and Carol in the morning on V103. Mm. And I, I had prank phone calls already, right? Because I was on the Buck Wild Morning Show yep. in Birmingham on 95.7. I was on with Buck in Africa. And uh, I already had prank phone calls. So I would go to do an interview for uh to tell people to come out to the comedy club but instead of doing an interview i was playing the prank phone calls so that got people excited because now your prank phone calls are funny on the air now people coming out to the show to the show and i was selling out i and i i stole this from your dad i did uh a comedy club in columbia south carolina i did five shows in one day five what time did you start i started at at uh, in the afternoon at noon. A noon show. Because yeah. I'm here to make money. I'm not here to lay in a hotel room all day. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Let's get it. That line was around the building. I was, that's the first time I made some money. I was able to buy a house. And All and, because and, of Lil Daryl. Yep. I bought a 95 Jeep Cherokee. You couldn't hit me in the ass. With the doors with off. <laughs> what? No, nah, no, nah, the Jeep, the, the box Jeep oh, Cherokee. Oh, the box one. Okay. 95. I had an army green 95 Jeep Cherokee. I thought I was rich riding around that damn <laughs> little bitty box Jeep Cherokee. Boy, my son was like, damn, we rich. We got a new car. Like, yeah, but let's go. But yeah. look, you didn't always start off selling off shows, selling off shows, because you got yeah. booed a few times. Yeah, I got booed you on got... Showtime of the Apollo. Yes. They booed me uh, when Mark Curry was the host. Yeah. They booed me because I was from Birmingham, Alabama, 
When Mark Curry said from Birmingham, Alabama. They said Alabama. Boo. Boo. <laughs> Boo. And Mark Curry said, uh, he said, uh, Rick, he said, just just perform through the booze. He said, your shit gonna air. He said it just like that. I went out there and they was booing the whole time and I went through my material. He said, just play the camera, play the camera, play the camera. So I was like, I got booed on Showtime of the Apollo, so let me tell you what happened. So I sent it home one night. I had a two bedroom apartment on the south side of Birmingham, across from a golf course. The rent was three thirty five. Wow! 330. Rent was wow! Wow! Thirty five dollars a month. I was sub leasing from a dude that had moved out. Thought I was balling. I'm sitting up there watching the, you know, it comes on. It's showtime mm -hmm. at, at the, the Apollo, Apollo. Mm -hmm. tonight. I'll never forget it. We have Jay, comedian Jay Lamont. Uh, H Town, and they showed them good night, knocking boot all night long. And then it said, Comedian Ricky Smart. I said, Hell no. Nah. I said, I know you freaking lying. I said, I know you lying. Hell no. Who? I got booed. And I'm sitting up there watching or oh, whatever. And I'm watching the show H Town. They came out knocking the boots. And then they showed Comedian Jay Lamont. And you wait. And then they went to commercial. I said, I know damn well. And then they show amateur night. So then that's when the booing started. So now I'm I'm sitting up here real, really nervous. Man, I came out there and I'm like, this ain't what happened. This is not what happened, Brandy Harvey. I know better than this. Cause you got booed. You I was got there. booed. I was there. I'm looking at the TV. I'm I call the TV a lie. I said, you a lie. Cause no booze. They up? took our audience that gave comedian Teddy Carpenter a standing ovation and took the booing out and put the laughs in. And then when I said, thank you, good night, I got a standing ovation. Man, my damn phone was ringing off the hook. <laughs> they been ringing, I said, hello. I said, thank you very much. All right, I'll call you back, click it on. Yeah, right, okay, I see, I, yeah, all right, I appreciate it. All right. Ricky, yeah, uh, Ricky. Yeah. You see me on there? <laughs> <laughs> and and funny. you yeah. I got boo. Boom. Boom. Brandy, I got booed. Listen. Brandy, they booed my socks. I got booed. <laughs> it was ugly, Brandy. It was ugly. Listen. I'm sitting up there like, I know damn well. How they do that? I and didn't even know that. Man, standing ovation, but that is not what happened. I got booed. You got booed. And you got booed when you opened up for Ice Cube. Yeah, I opened up for Ice Cube and the Lynch Mob. Uh, D-Nice was on the show. <laughs> Too Short was on the show. I had never had a black audience. I was fun performing in front of white people all the time. <laughs> Hear my ass come out there with a comedy club routine, not taking the mic out the stand. And I, hey, how's everybody going? How's everybody doing tonight? And, and, and Ice Cube and them sitting over there with a baseball bat in the lynch mob. Ice Cube had his curl with the lynch mob. It was the ghetto boy, the, the, uh, the, the little rest in peace. Uh, uh, Bush, Bush Bill. Bill. You know, I came off there, Bush Whit Bill sitting over there, his legs, I ain't even touching him before. He was just looking at me like, man, this, man, that shit was wet, yo. <laughs> But Ricky, I it had booed. to have taught you something. What did it teach you? Because most people would it give me up. To get re taught me to get ready for a black audience. Mm. And then, and then when your dad started coming to town, that's when black people started coming to the comedy club because it was just mainly a white audience. When your dad first, when your dad first came, when I met your dad, your, you knew, do you know your dad was twenty nine years old when I met him? Listen, and I was nineteen. I met him when he was twenty six. So. <laughs> I met your dad, he was 29. Yeah. The comedy club owner, Bruce Ayers, was 39, and I was 19. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was tall, skinny, worked at Oak Tree. Uh, oh, whatever, because we worked for the same company. We got so much in common. We both worked for the Edison Brothers. I worked at Oak Tree also in Jeans West. That's the same company. Wow. Jeans West, Oak Tree, Baker Shoes. You worked at Baker Shoes? Yeah, I worked at Baker Shoes for a minute. You I worked know, at Tom was... McAnn Shoes, Baker Shoes. Oh, you was all, all the I was brands. a salesman. Listen, oh, yeah. All the vibes. Yeah, shout out to Jeans West. Shout out to Ayana Miller. Like, like we like, like I would if, I would be in there like, yeah, working. If you grew up in the 80s and 90s, you knew Tom McCann, you was going school shopping there. Man, Baker's... I would die, to, I would die to prom shoes. Back then you oh, pick what you color you bring in a piece shoes. of your material yes. to your prom dress. I used to get that dye together. I used to dye your prom shoes All for All the you. colors. And the matching handbag. The port of soie. Man, I would sit up yes. there and let a woman try on the shoe and then I'd go get the handbag, put the handbag next to the shoe. <laughs> or whatever. She said, oh, that dude look good together because you make more money on your accessories. <laughs> yeah. See, come on now. See, your dad know what I'm talking about. We so, we so close. We are, cause 
pants? Yeah. So uh, uh, buy the jacket, get the pants free. Buy Oak the tree. jacket, get the pants buy the free. Suit coat, get the pants free. So you got all this salesman experience, yeah. which really played into your comedy. Teach life. you how to present yourself. Yeah. Yeah. How are you today, ma'am? Would you like Would you like to look at the new twenty nine ninety nine? Yeah. You know, yeah. But you know what? One of the things that you said in one of your interviews was the difference now with comedians, right? Mm -hmm. Because of social media, mm -hmm. you all had to learn how to perform on the front end. We did. And now comedians have to learn how to perform on the back on end the because back they end. get the followers, but they uh, the performers have to catch up to the followers. Yeah. We had to. <laughs> We were performers, and then we had to learn social media. Yeah. So it was. It, that's all it is. It's a flip flop. Mm -hmm. How do you see the difference? Are with people being able to learn the craft and be able to get on stage and present live? Some of it. Some of them did. Uh, B Simone has done really well. Um, we did some dates on the Martin tour. Just hilarious. Um, uh, DC Young Fly have a hell of a show, and yeah. Desi Banks also. Yeah. Uh, and I remember watching them, uh, uh, Chico Bean, that's like my nephew right there, who I absolutely love. A lot of people didn't know. Did you know Chico Bean was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha? He's, I did not know he's that. He's divine now. Chico Bean is okay. a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. That's, that's like my nephew who I really, really love. We have a bond. But uh, I had to watch a lot of them, uh, and I watched them grow, and I watched them get better and better. Uh, as the years go by, so I'm proud of all of them. So you find yourself as the mentor now. Oh yeah, you're, you're the mentor. You the big yeah. brother. I get I get phone calls, and sometimes I critique if they open to it. Uh, I don't try to tell anyone what to do because it's a different time now. You just can't say stuff. You can say something if it's your show, but if you own the show, you say, hey, if you open to some advice, I have some for you. And uh, most of them are really open to yeah. it. Nobody, they, they're not sensitive like. The generation that they're a part of they, yeah. they want to learn they want to be better they want to you know what i'm saying so um and uh, it's funny to hear uh the newer comedians call you og how the hell when did i become an og <laughs> and, and it, it calling you zaddy with a z they be calling you zaddy ricky yeah i get it yeah because i got the great the little gray beard. I, I stopped doing the uh just for men you did you stopped doing the beijing i you never know? did the be hold on brandon <laughs> hold up y'all ain't finna I never did the. I did do the just for men. You just put a little, just a, a little, little comb But through. I find out that women like the look. They like that. They like that. It looks very distinguished. Yeah, the wisdom or yeah. whatever. You, you know look what I'm like you know what you're yeah. talking about. Like yeah, you got look, a few coins, you know. Look, look, some, look some. like look like you might have a boat. <laughs> yeah, I could take you to Applebee's. You, you know? could take me to Applebee's <laughs> right. or something, you know. Applebee's be hitting low keto. It does. Yeah, I still be hitting. I haven't been in a spot. while. Yeah, I go. I never want to walk out smelling like fajitas. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't smell like fajitas when you come out of Applebee's. You know, don't that you? That mean that shit good, Brandy. <laughs> Is it? You walk out smelling like food. I'm going to Busy Bees when I leave. Are you crazy? I know you are. I'm going to have fried chicken all in my clothes. <laughs> I have, I must have some turkey wings, some dressing, and some macaroni and cheese and greens today. People don't know this, though, that some people don't know you are an excellent cook. Excellent. You are known for your black eyed peas, your chicken and dumplings. Chicken and dumplings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I have I've a never, been and cheese, uh, never been invited. Never been invited. Never been invited. Brandon, you can dinner. come anytime. You can come and bring the whole camera set up. We'll I'll, I'll prepare dinner and you sit there and eat. I know you don't eat pork. I can cook around that. Okay. I will make you some good greens with some smoked turkey and I saute my greens. Okay. So uh, from the sink to the pot, my greens are ready in 20, 25 minutes with a slight crunch. They saute well seasoned. Uh, a chef here. And Alana kind of uh, gave me that recipe, but I took it and add, added my own little twist to it. But uh, my collard greens are to die for. I put them on the internet and they went viral. Every, a lot of people cook their greens that way now. You don't have to boil greens all you day. Don't. You can saute them you can. like cabbage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so but chicken and dumplings, you oh, said, yeah. is your, that is your dish. That's my dish. That's Ain't nobody messing wants. with you. And the thing about what makes the chicken and dumplings special, you can't cook it in the summer because it's too hot yeah and chicken and dumplings is not like pinto beans you can't just put it and just let it boil you have to stand there and stir because if you don't they will either stick or turn into a big ass biscuit <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want that you have to stir chicken and dumplings are really sensitive you have to know what you're doing it's a certain way it's not the recipe it's the how yeah. So my grandmother and my great grandmother taught me how to make good chicken and dumplings, and I'm known for chicken and dumplings. I would be happy to make you some. I I love that. One, you are just like a country man who know how to cook. Fish, fix cars, out, outdoorsman. Like you should be winning. It's a woman out here who got a honeydew list with your name on it. 
can't, uh, uh, Atlanta definitely is not, I'm not saying it ain't no good women in Atlanta, but damn, they, <laughs> they, be, they be texting you. They'll, they'll take you like, good morning. They'll text you. They cash app and like, good morning. Like somebody has ca- sent you their cash app. It's disgusting. It, it, it's, we, we can talk relationship. I can just give you my perspective. And Do my, it. Give me your, your perspective. I just have bad dating experience. You're uh, over 50. I am You're over 50. You're a man over 50. I am. Are you looking to date? Absolutely. Oh, okay. But the right person. Okay. You know what I'm saying? You got a whole career and a whole brand. You can't have nobody that will try to ruin your career. If they yeah. get mad at you or ruin your brand, you got to make a woman sign a... Uh, a NDA. A, yeah, all of that and, 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 and this, that. and They got to have something to lose, though, Ricky. You know, huh? They got to have something to lose. It's hard to find somebody that, that have something to lose that you're attracted to. I got to be attracted to her, too, now. Mm, yeah. Okay, yeah. she over here rich, but she ain't got no neck. <laughs> Wait a minute! Not she got no, no I'm just, neck. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, hey, uh, fellas, know I'm being real. She over here. She got all this stuff going on, but she's not attracted. She got to be attracted. So do you have? She got to walk by, and I, I, I need to be like, damn! Every time she walk by, even with no makeup and no lashes on. Okay. Do yeah. you have a type? Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, I have a type. What's your type? Listen, let me just tell you this. <laughs> I was walking. I was walking in Atlanta airport, and this lady was bow legged. Was walking in front of me. I ran up on her, trying to get her. It was Marjorie. <laughs> I saw you I said, told that I on said, Shannon. Show. Oh, I said, "Disgusting." She said, "Disgusting." I said, "Yeah, you're disgusting." She said, "You're disgusting." I said, "Get away from me." She said, "Get away from me." So you got a little tight. Bow legged. I love a bow legged woman. I love nice, slender workout. But more than that, a good attitude. Yeah, that's important. Somebody, a friend, somebody. Yeah somebody that that can listen to you somebody that you can't live without you don't even have to know how to cook because i cook you don't have to wash and dry clothes because i do all of that i will wash and dry them clothes and fold them down towels up like the damn four season hotel <laughs> you ought to see my towels and my rags and the way everything my counters there you know when i when i wipe down the counter i'll be like this you be looking zoom in zoom in I, I be like, <laughs> get damn out of here What Brandon, you be doing? Brandon. You be on the countertop like that. When I, when I Windex my counter, I'll... you looking to see? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. My, my kitchen, my kitchen is neat, clean. I'm not, and that's not OCD. No, that is. That's good home. That training. is good home training. Yeah, put yes. the chair back to the th- people like he OCD. Putting it, asking you to put the chair back to the table that was already there when you sat down. Listen, you're not going to clown me about being OCD. Listen. How about you're nasty? <laughs> Your house. Some people's houses is yeah. real questionable. Yeah, put the yeah. Put the plate in the rinse the plate off. Put it in the dishwasher, or, or whatever. That's not OCD. That is not. That's not that OCD. Is, that is. That's I good home take training. care of my house. Right. I live here. Yeah. You know. Um, you know. Good attitude. Nice. Uh, kind. Thoughtful. Spiritual. Yeah. Love God. Yeah. Um. Somebody to talk to. Uh. Somebody that's not shallow. You got women out here. I went on a date in Atlanta. She named every single housewife of Atlanta, past, present, everybody on Love and Hip Hop, <laughs> and did not know who Bill Campbell was. She did not know who Shirley Franklin was. She did oh, not God. know who Nina Turner was. She did not know who represented her in Congress. Bless her she heart. didn't know who Joe Biden was. How did you meet this woman, Ricky? Barack Obama was president of the United States. I mean, you don't know that she don't know all that stuff when you meet him. So you meet him, you ask him out, you get, get the dinner. Because she had bow legs and she was fine. She, bow legs, she fine, fine. And all that stuff, hair on point or uh, whatever. Uh, and and they just, didn't a even lot know the of mayor. them, they're just shallow. <laughs> I said, do you vote? <laughs> well, sometimes. Sometimes. Like, I'm from Birmingham, you know, I'm a member of the NAACP yeah. and the NCLC. Like, I participated in civil rights, not civil rights movement from the 60s. Yeah. But when Benita Carter got killed in 79, I was a kid out there marching and protesting yeah. and stuff. And I've been a lifetime member of the SCLC and the NAACP, so stuff like that matter or whatever. And part of what you do is right. you bring awareness to that on your platform. Absolutely. You are always uh, getting folks in office. Yeah, being Crump, and yeah, we get... I remember one time we got a slew of black judges uh, elected in Dallas, Texas and stuff. And we was out here campaigning for Craig Watkins, who was a 29-year-old capper that was running for district attorney who reopened the Kennedy files. I mean, I I can get in the pocket and tell you everything about politics. I love politics. But 
And just in case we sit at the table with the Obamas, you have something to add to the conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. That's important. Absolutely. For me, if you don't have nothing to add or, or whatever, you know. And then uh, if she's sexy without lashes and makeup and, and all that stuff, that's a win. It's a win. It's a win. Because when she do put the stuff on, you're like, damn. It's even better. Like, oh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You know, she look good with some little gym shorts on, walking around the house and she ain't got no makeup. A little cup of coffee or some tea. Yeah. In, in, the, in the kitchen doing yoga. And Namaste. Tea, you know, Namaste. Stuff. Yeah, that little stuff cute. It's cute. Yeah, it's cute. But if, if she don't know who represent her in Congress. <laughs> She and, she and, can't go with you to the Obama and, and can't name at least two of the disciples. <laughs> <laughs> she gotta know a disciple. We gotta know of. somebody who wrote a gospel. She she, I heard of somebody named yeah. James, but I got a cousin right now, baby. No, because faith is very important to you. It is. Faith has really been the cornerstone of your career. I mm -hmm. mean, from you've been a minister of music, you mm -hmm. were a musician. People don't know you play yeah. piano and the organ trumpet, and the I baritone, mean, the yeah, French horn, the tuba. Yeah, play around with the bass guitar. Cause you really thought that's what you were gonna do with your yeah, life. I thought I was gonna be an organist. My yeah. my goal was to become a professional organist playing at a church, because I love that B three. I love the piano. Uh, I started out playing classical music on the piano. I used to read music, mm -hmm. you know, sit there and read sheet music. And you have to. I, I used to have to do piano recitals in in, in elementary school and middle school, and I was the only boy and I was the only black. Oh wow! So it was all white girls and me. Piano recital just just up there killing it. I was absolutely terrible. We, me and my sister, were forced to play piano. Really? For like ten years, Ricky. When I say I would every week to my mother, like this is a waste of money. You don't. You Awful. Don't, is there one song you still know how to play? I was on this song called Two Wild Rose for uh -huh. literally three years. I can play da 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 da. That's it. Tell Greatest five. That faithfulness was the hymn. Right. I learned the first like stanza. Like first, no ma'am. Of greatest I faith. I was obsessed with music. I'm obsessed with I was, Elton John. I could sing though. Like I was, I was a good like do up our show choir. Right. I was the show so choir. You sing? Not like that. Right. Not right. like that. But you could. You but could I can sing hold it. I can. I'm a. I'm a strong alto. I can't alto. sing. But I can. I can. I can teach the altos. I can teach the sopranos. I can teach the tenors yeah. that part. And uh, whatever. I'm gonna hold my. I'm gonna hold my part. Absolutely. So I. I can do that. I can you just do can't that. solo. Mm, it's not my ministry. Yeah, but you're in the background. Order my steps, steps. in your word. Yes. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Me, yeah. God me. Yeah. Every, every day. Me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll do it every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so faith is important to mm -hmm. you. You grew up with your grandparents. I so did. you have this like very old soul, old mm -hmm. Ain't school nothing wrong with it. vibe. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Uh, it worked out for me. It worked out for me. It worked out for your dad. It worked out for you. Yeah, it did. And there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, we were having a conversation about this. The problem in today's society um, is uh, we have to give kids more of what we had as opposed to what we did not have. Yeah. And that's the problem. Uh, somebody on Facebook was saying we create cats. Deion Sanders said that, I think. We're creating cats instead of creating a dog. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I got video. I was looking at a video came up on my uh, Facebook memories, maybe like four years ago, with my youngest son out there working in the yard. Mm -hmm. Like he needed three hundred dollars to buy his books at Alabama State. He said, "My sons never ask for money." He said, "Dad, do you have some work for us?" I always got work, you know, and I had him out there. And then he went up in the upstairs and had my grandson, who I have custody of, and had him outside in the hot sun working their ass off mm -hmm. to make it $300. And so I went live on Facebook. Women was jumping on there, talking about was shaming me. It's a shame that you got a three-year-old kid out there working. What, what is that going to do for a kid that's three years old? You know, the alpha females sit up there to try to te teach a man how to raise a boy, yeah. those women. And I made a whole nother Facebook post, and I went all the way in on them. Yeah. How dare you? Uh, try to undermine me as a parent. I'm yeah. trying to raise him to be somebody that's worthy enough to marry your granddaughter. That is the thing. You Absolutely. Know, me and my sister talk about this all the time. My sister is married. She has a son. They have a son. And he's seven years old. And she just told me that when they went to parent night that the other parents in his second grade class were like, you know, BJ is so task oriented. He's such a leader. He's always on the mm -hmm. like cleanup and everything. Right. And they were like, she said, well, he has to load the laundry. Like, he has to do, if he wants something clean, Absolutely. he ha he knows that the parents were like, 
He knows how to load laundry. You're damn and right. he, she was like, I'm raising a future husband Come on and now. father. Come on he now. is not going to be a child forever. Yeah, I got at my daughters about uh, coming down the stairs when they smell food, talking about, do you need some help or anything? You know I was down here cooking. <laughs> Don't play with me. If you're going to be a wife, yeah. you need to come over here and, and, and figure out how to make these this macaroni and cheese and these string beans and, and cut up these eye potatoes, as old folks say, <laughs> or whatever. You know, uh, you're going to be a wife someday. You, you, you're you a teenager now, but you're going to be a wife someday. Yeah. Right? And a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. You need to be able to provide for your family. And that's what I try to do as a man. Because I still work in the yard. Yeah. Uh, I was out, I was in the flower bed pulling weeds yesterday. I still, and I can pay somebody to go and do stuff, but I still go out and work in my yard. But, you know, most people, I think, in this day and age, they hear that and they're like, I don't need to get prepared to be no wife. I, that's not my duty. And that's I don't why they buy to... sell. All that talking. <laughs> See, all that talking and, and that. The fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talking with your hands. What they do, Ricky? By themselves. By, by myself. They... Yeah, all, all, all of that. By myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, had a, uh, I went out to dinner with uh, not too long ago. I said, I want a man to lead. And I'm like, and she hit me up the next day, like, how was dinner? I'm like, it was nice. The food was good as hell. Like, we went to a really nice spot to eat. I really enjoyed the food. But how you told me you want a man to lead and you talk 95% of the conversation? Mm. A whole chatterbox. Mm. Not, I said, well, tell me something about me. She couldn't tell me nothing. Wow. Because you talked the whole time. You asked me nothing about me. Everything was about you, mm. right? And it was like, like dates like that and uh, table manners is important. And if you don't have table manners, I'll teach you if you're willing to learn. If you ain't stuck on it, well, this is just how I am. How oh, I am. Okay, if that's how you are, then I, I, I can't tell you how to be. But I know that we're going to be sitting, sitting here with the Obamas at some point. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't want to be embarrassed, so I know I can't take you. <laughs> not going to sit up here in front of the Obamas and eat your greens with your hands. Now, you do that in private. You get them greens in that cornbread. With the cornbread, you got to. You got to twist that thing up right and get you some onions and some tomatoes. And get a nice little. You got to, you got to get it right. You got to, mm-hmm. you got to spin it though. In that bowl. Spin it, yeah, in the bowl, bowl. And, uh, and mm. then put it in. And you got to be, you got to be watching in the heat of the night. <laughs> Not in the heat of you the gotta night. Got to have a box fan over there from Walmart. The ones that be on the front for twenty nine dollars <laughs> that be on sale. <laughs> you gonna be watching First Forty Eight? I heard that's your show. Boy, what? That's your show. First Forty Eight to have your ass getting up in the middle of the night, looking out a window, thinking that that the guys that they got is outside of your house. <laughs> I'd be walking through that bed with that damn 45. I'd be having that. I'd be, I had one in the chamber. I'd be looking out of windows two o'clock at night. What is it about the music of First 48? You fall asleep on the couch, especially them, them damn Detroit episode when they don't find the murder. <laughs> Talking about if you have any information, please call Crime Stoppers. Man, at First 48 freaked me out. Then, then the, the show about them going to jail for 60 days. Come on, you be watching The 60 that. day jail. I, I, I did a binge <laughs> one day, Ricky. I can't do it. But like, you know, you know my show now. My show is my six hundred pound life. You talked about that six hundred. Yeah. I can't watch it, Ricky, because Brandy, I just I feel so uncomfortable Brandy, watching the people. Sometimes reci- you get your recipes. <laughs> yeah, I don't want no recipes. You get your recipes. <laughs> off of my six hundred pound life. Learn some good recipes. You have to watch my six hundred pound. What's life. the recipe you yeah, learned uh, off one, of my six hundred? Uh, uh, please uh, tell me. Tater tot casserole. A tater tot casserole. Y'all hear this? A tater tot casserole. I was a white lady. I think she was in Kansas, and I. And she had a minivan. All of them got a minivan. They, you got to have a minivan. You got to have a minivan. Was she cooking the, this tater tot casserole in the, the bed? She put the tater tots in the bottom. Was she in the bed while she was nah, cooking? No, nah, that lady was in the bed. She frying chicken. <laughs> that in lady the bed. in the bed. And she had all the seasonings up on the headboard. Boy. She had onion powder, garlic powder, uh, paprika. In a in the bed. Uh, sage. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, she had all, the, all of that stuff mm-hmm. on, on the headboard. And she had the, uh, the little hot plate. Pulled up to the little nightstand and she was laying in the bed. She couldn't move, but she was frying the hell out of that chicken. And she was dipping it in the flowers in the egg back and forth <laughs> with the chicken. It'd be real crunchy. In the bed. In the bed. And you don't watch that with nobody. You watch that by yourself. You have to. Because you don't want nobody to see you laughing because we all going to hell. Everybody. We are going to hell. Because really it's the doctor on the show. Oh, he get the, the ass. So doc, 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 uh, is it Dr. Mm-hmm. Yes or Dr. Now? The Dr. Now. Dr. Now. Dr. Now. Yeah. Dr. now. You'll, 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 you'll get kicked out the program. Do you understand? Yeah, you're eating. She said, uh, I don't well, know what I'm I, doing. I I'm not food. eating. I need protein. He said, you have enough protein to last a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> he 
He be wearing their ass he out. He be wearing them out. They be having an attitude. They be in the bed. First of all, I need to eat. I need to get down. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I ain't losing nothing. Then one night he went under the bed and he found a uh, big ass 20 ounce pop. That was up under the bed. Somebody had snuck in there. And I watched one episode where they had 19 pieces. They went to went pieces. I saw that episode. They bought 19 I pieces. saw that when episode. They got to the house. They had four. They, listen. I said, I had. I thought I had missed something during the commercial. I said, what? I, they bought 19 pieces at Ricky, Pizza Hut. When I saw that, I said, I can't watch it. Now, my sister, yeah. she loves that show. I'm obsessed with that, that show. That is it. But you got a tater tot casserole off of it. Tater tot casserole. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you have to fry the tater tots first. First. And then put them in the bottom of the pan mm -hmm. and then layer it with everything and then bake it. Cheese and bacon the and eggs. And, and stuff. Yeah. Bake. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, and so that's your recipe now. Uh, I tried it. It was actually pretty good. But I didn't eat as much as they did. Because <laughs> they ate the whole pan. Yeah, yeah. She goes all the way in. I saw a lady on the episode. The plate, it was the plate was this big. She served yeah. her on a plate that was literally this big. Yeah, and when the dude bought the plate, I thought it was for all of them. And it was And then he set it down and then he went back and got, got two hit. small plates for him and the son. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was sitting over there. But that's your show. <laughs> you sit over here trying not to lay. You going to hell. But that's your show. That's my show. That's your show. My, First I have to have that in my life. First 48, my 600-pound life. Uh, you know I watch the news. I have to you, watch you, Joy you, Reid, Rachel Maddow. You, you, know, you and my mama could watch TV together all day. MSNBC Listen, all day. That's all she got on all day. CNN, mm -hmm. anything with Roland Martin on there. <laughs> Roland, Martin, Roland Martin be wearing ascot. We just need him to stop wearing ascots. <laughs> He that is wearing, his signature look, Ricky. I don't care. That is his signature. I'm so tired of that casket material uh, <laughs> up in there. He needs to stop. He to and he's on my morning show. And, and Roland Martin and I, we do not like each other. And he's on my morning show a lot. And sitting in the bed. In the, he wear at the bed. He, the, the, the ass, he's a member of Alpha Phi. We love I know Roland he Martin, is, yeah. But, but he needs to take that, that He needs to take it off. off. It's time. We're tired of it. It's time. We're okay, tired. We need that's to vote. fair. Go to um, check out my new website, Roland Martin, get rid of the ascot.com. <laughs> <laughs> and you know he gonna roast me, right? He is coming you know, for you. He clapped back. He he coming. I got all day. He I'm got not, a good I'm one. I'm not afraid of Roland Martin. I got all day. What I love about you, and you've been so transparent about this, you had a moment. You said David E. Tauber saved your life. Yeah, he did. He saved my, I feel like he saved my life and my career. Uh, from a financial standpoint, I had bad management. I had management that had totally taken advantage of me. Um, you know, when people get to talking and 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 and, and smiling too hard and teeth too white and perfect and all that extra time I went to an HBCU, I got a degree in accounting <laughs> and 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 rip your ass off, uh, uh, rip me off. Uh, had you had you working like a dog, keep your ass so busy you don't have time to pay attention to your finances. Mm. And uh, uh, total, I had a total conflict of interest situation. Um, I met uh, Alan Nevins uh, through David E. Talbot. David E. Talbot said, man, you need to come to L.A. I got on the plane and went to L.A. and had lunch with David E. Talbot. He said, Rick, this your new manager right here. He just told me. David E. Talbot, I did Jingle Jangle, mm -hmm. Baggage Claim. Yeah. First Sunday, him and Lynn, his wife, are two of my best friends. Like, I don't know how or why we just are we just have good chemistry these these are just two people that i love uh they we, we take vacations together now mm -hmm. and everything we are really good david e tavern and i was in a big ass tank um with 600 pound bull sharks swimming around in bimini bahamas anybody get a chance to go to bimini bahamas it's only 55 miles from uh fort lauderdale and 50 miles from miami if you find somebody with a boat go to bimini bahamas Everybody know that that's my island. He just invited you because, you know, he's a boat captain and, you know, yeah. he takes his boat. And, so. and, and then when I see people over there on the cruise ship, they're like, we came over here because you always talk about the island. Wow. So, so it's almost like I'm the mayor of Bimini, <laughs> Bahamas. And uh, it's a nice little boat ride if you can find some good weather and jump out there on your boat. And uh, uh, But we was in the cage underwater with some 600 pound aggressive bull shark swimming around so they put blood and chum in the water they bloody up the water and sharks come from everywhere so we in the cage and we we talking we looking at each other underwater and a big ass shark just came by the cage like that we just stuck our hand out there and just rubbed it on the side because the sharks don't have a reaction like a bulldog you touch a bulldog he can turn around and bite you yeah shark just real slow just keep going 
and we just touch and they feel like sandpaper. Did you wow, know that? I did not. They look real smooth and slick, but when you touch them, they feel like sandpaper. And uh, so we was under that feeding the stingrays, the uh, the nurse sharks, the bull sharks, a couple of tiger sharks, mm. and just under the water. But David E. Talbot, you got to ask him to post it because he under there, you know, he video, he under there with his phone, and we got all kind of video footage of it. Uh, but uh, but that was a great experience with yeah. him. But anyway, he introduced me to Alan. Uh, Alan got my finances cleaned up. We got on a flight from Atlanta. Uh, on Southwest Airlines, we were sitting in the back of a plane, the middle seat empty. We had five boxes. We put the boxes in the overhead, man. And that was like a 30-minute flight from Atlanta to L.A. because we were going through all those paperwork. We got mm -hmm. all this stuff together. Got a new business manager. She was awesome. Uh, Laura Lizer uh, out in L.A. Uh, she had some big clients, and we developed a bond, and she got me set up for life. Mm. and stuff and got me into real estate and everything a lot of people don't know that oh wow yeah got me all into real estate and um uh got me doing doing pretty well yeah and so between alan nevins and laura lizer and um uh, uh uh my entertainment attorney paul um you know they did they just really took care of my career for these past probably past seven years and yeah. it's been awesome because people don't know that you that rough spot that you hit you were, oh yeah Man, I was doing a TV, I was doing a morning show, and then I would do Dish Nation after the morning show in the same studio, then run across town to shoot the Ricky Smiley show, the sitcom I had with Ray J, J. Anthony Brown, mm, yeah. or whatever, and going to bed at 11, 12 o'clock at night, only to be back up at 5 the next morning. And, and, and I was doing that with Roger Barr Productions, so you're doing three episodes a week, three episodes a week. So rehearsal, shoot, rehearsal, shoot, rehearsal, shoot. That was for weeks. And uh, I did that, and I was just worn out, tired. Um, I don't know how I got through that, but I would never do nothing like that. That made me not like doing TV. Uh, sitting in a trailer now, I can't even do it. Because you've done all the movies. You've been in Friday After Next. You've mm -hmm. done all the things, all the stand-up, reality shows, mm -hmm. cooking shows, six seasons of a reality show, mm -hmm. right? But now you have really created a lot of boundaries in your life. Oh, yeah. Because you don't perform in the summer. You take the At summers all. off. Take the whole summer off. Getting off the air at 8.30 in the morning on a Friday and be like, okay, grandkids in there, you know, eating toast and, and, and Eggo waffles. Or I make them a Belgian waffle. <laughs> Going outside, swimming. Yeah. Watching the movie. Sitting in the, th in the little room watching the movie. Going to church. Going to choir rehearsal. Just simple stuff. Simplicity. Getting in the car, say, hey, we're going to the beach today, loading up the truck. We jumping in the truck, me and the grandkids. We going down uh, to Destin, Florida, sitting on the beach for the weekend, driving back on a Sunday, going to Sunday school, going to church or whatever. Sunday dinner. Simplicity. Give yourself a break. You cannot make the shot if you don't create space. Mm. When LeBron makes a shot, he takes a step back to shoot the ball. Yeah. Right? You have to create space. If you don't create space, you'll get your shot blocked. I've been doing all this grinding and stuff for years. Yeah, you're making a lot of money. And I was sitting in the airport in Atlanta in the middle of June, in the middle of June on a Saturday. I'm looking on Facebook, everybody at a family reunion, everybody at class reunion, at the beach having a good time, yeah. and you going to Tulsa, Oklahoma yeah. to perform. Yeah, your show sold out, but what quality of life is that to sit on the plane and go all the way to Tulsa only to get up? Up the next morning, fly back to Atlanta to change planes to go to Birmingham, only to start over, all over again the next week. Yeah. No weekends to yourself, no time to yourself. You can't enjoy anything. You sleep. You can't enjoy your kids because you're sleepy. Sitting up there in the window washing dishes, watching your grandkids on the swing outside. My the swing set is outside of the kitchen window, and sitting there watching your grandkids enjoying the swing and sliding on the sliding board is worth millions. Yeah. Damn a comedy club. Damn a show. You've done that for 30 something years. It's time, some time for you before you get too old. I can still dive off a diving board. I can still dive off the side of a boat. I can still swim in the ocean. You know what I'm saying? I, I go out and do some relaxing things with my friends and, 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 and relatives that I like. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, the ones <laughs> that I, like. I caught it. I, caught I don't it. fool with all of them. I don't, like, I don't like some of them. Yeah. But that's just, I'm just being real. 
uh, whatever, because I that's a whole nother a whole nother conversation. But I think that comes with wisdom, though. Yeah. I mean, I think, and that comes with age, and that comes with the experiences, because. Mm-hmm. You know, you're over fifty now. Your mm-hmm. your thirties, I feel like, really life be life in. You start yeah. to understand that in your thirties. I 30s. feel thirty though. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't feel. You know. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I never did. I don't have any health problems. Yeah. You know, uh, getting up peeing every five minutes. <laughs> it does happen. It does happen. It you does gotta happen. Pee. You gotta go all the time. Yeah. Yeah. To get me a, a a bag or something. <laughs> don't say it, please. A, a, a water balloon and a rubber band. <laughs> Well, I don't have to get up out of the bed. I put I had an adult diaper on last night. So I'm gonna try this. You did not. <laughs> I did, boy. Ricky. I feel that pamper up. Oh my God, Ricky. I feel that. I feel, hey, <laughs> look at the people behind. I wish y'all could look behind the camera. Look how everybody trying to. Because they are laugh. thrown off yeah, right they, now. They, that they whole, first of all, we got a visual. Okay, I we got a, a visual. I had a whole huggy. I had a, <laughs> I, I had a huggy on last night. I had a chick came over. I got a chick come over there now to change me in the middle of the night. You know how the babies be open up their leg when they ready to get changed? <laughs> they back there cracking up. It's it's cut. We're going to cut that out. Thank you. Y'all so, going to cut that out? I don't know. It feels a that's, little like, eh. That's funny. <laughs> they know everybody. The audience know darn well I ain't went to sleep in no huggy. No, we know. Yeah, okay. We know you didn't. You you didn't come this fly today <laughs> right. and, and go to bed in the huggy last night. Just because you're too lazy you, to get up and go to the bathroom. You too fresh. The the sneaks is too clean. You, Thank you. You you're looking too good. I had that. to do a little little some some simple something. simple accessories. I ain't got to do too much. You did, you did it. Yeah. But I think that your life and your career has been a testament to your faith. Mm-hmm to how much you are willing to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And you've had to sacrifice a lot I did. In, in this, in particularly in this season. Yeah. Because you have not, trauma has not skipped your door at all. Yeah, uh, that was probably the worst time of my life. Uh, the last time I ate a meal at your dad's house, my son was with me. Your, your, your dad knew my son. Yeah. Uh, my son was with me when I opened up for the Kings of Comedy. Uh, my son met, uh, I got pictures with my son and your dad uh, or whatever. Uh, that was the worst thing. I, I wouldn't wish that on nobody. But uh, Brandon, I'm going to tell you this. It's all about the perspective. Because, you know, right when you get the feeling sad about what you've been through and what cut your tears in half, when you get a phone call on Facebook or a message on Messenger that, here goes some woman that's 40 who 17 year old son got murdered and she's in Birmingham or wherever she is. She just needs somebody to talk to. You know, I had a dude, uh, that's one of my Facebook friends that called me three o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, Martin Edwards, uh, he's a Kappa. We Facebook friends and my, and he called me like, why is he calling me at three o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Hey ma'am, my son just got murdered and you got to sit there. And you got to have that conversation. I got time to talk to you. Yeah. Yes, three o'clock in the morning, but I can talk to you. Yeah. My show starts at five. Yes, my son. I know Rick, you're going through a lot yourself. Yes, my son died a couple of months ago, but I got time to talk to you. Yeah. And sit up there. See, the thing about it is, Brandy, it ain't about just you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And 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 when you you don't make things about you, uh, God, you you allow God to use you. So. What God does is, it's a test to see how you handle your situation. Are you going to make it about you? Or are you going to use your situation to give him the glory in order to help other people? Yeah. Right? And I just had to take it like a man. God had already prepared me for my son's death. I already knew that it was coming. You did? I did. How did you know? I, I just knew. Um, I, and I called my other kids home a year before it happened and sat them down and told them that this was coming. You got they, a vision of it. Yes. Wow. They cried then. And, um, and and we went through it. And it was like, really? You at the funeral, you really couldn't grieve mm. because your kids sitting behind you, distraught and crying. You had to comfort them. And then I had a three-year-old granddaughter over there looking at me talking about Papa ready to play and don't even understand what's going on. Yeah. What's Understand what's going on. And so I had to leave. I had to make sure my son's uh, mother was straight. My son had an awesome mother, regardless of what we went through in our custody battle uh, for our son, because she loved him just as much as I did. And but when it when it came time 
to do what was right. And when he died, I had to make sure that um, she was comfortable and I had respect for her and her husband and they had what they needed. I had to do what was right for them. And uh, I don't, you know, I put myself last, but, uh, uh, and I know I, with that Smiley is a name and a brand, but my son had a mother yeah. that laid down and gave birth to him. That was that was awesome. And before people pray for me, I would I would hope that they would pray for my son's mother yeah. and my son's stepdad. Uh, yeah. They were awesome parents, and um, I just I regardless of what I went through with her, I would not wish that on my worst, and I never would have wished that for her. Yeah. And to see um, a mother. Um, uh, go through that because I'm sitting here feeling one way at the funeral, but she's sitting on the other opposite end of the road that I was sitting on. I just couldn't imagine how she was feeling. Yeah. She the one laid down and gave birth and, and had him. Um, so even when I threw my hands up and said, I can't do it no more because I went through this stuff for 15 years with my son. Even when I threw my hands up and can do it no more, they're just a dad or whatever, you know, and I, it was hard because I had to set some boundaries and I had to create some space between my son and I. She stuck with him. And my is mom, that because he had an addiction or? Yeah, he had been struggling with his addiction for years Yeah. or whatever. And, um, you know, my, um, I had to, you know, my mom, you know, they were, they were all optimistic or whatever. I was optimistic too because, I mean, hell, I sent them to rehab. And yeah. Rehab ain't cheap. You know, uh, very expensive, and I, I went through that stuff. Uh, Brandy, he died on a, on a Sunday, and um, when he when I got the call that that they was rushing him to the hospital, uh, I was trying to pack a bag. Then I got a phone call from his sister, and his mother that he had passed. And I was trying to pack a backpack, still trying to pack a backpack. Cause I had found a flight on Southwest and um, I made a, a Facebook post announcing that he had passed away and to keep our families in prayer. Turned my, uh, I went out, I walked out the hallway and that hallway was so long. And I was like, um, if God allow me to make it down this hallway to this elevator out of this apartment, I can make it. Cause the hardest thing to do is to walk down that hall. Mm. That hallway was spinning around. Yeah, it was spinning. I, I couldn't see the floor. It was spinning. My brain was spinning. I could see my son' face when he was a kid. I remember the how the butterflies felt in my stomach because when they when I got the call back, I thought they was gonna say he's stable. They got him in intensive care. Um, uh, we don't or at least. We don't know right now. They uh, no. They called back and she was like, "He died." She was crying. It was his younger sister. Um, I made it to the elevator, and I made it to the car. Got to the airport, um, Lovefield Airport, and I asked the Dallas police officer. I said, "Hey, listen." I said, "My son just died. I'm confused. I don't mm. know where I am." Wow. I felt like I was about to pass out. I said, "Can you just walk me to my gate?" And and he, he, he got me through TSA and he when he got halfway down the hall he pointed me uh to the gate and uh people s were speaking. They didn't know that my yeah. son died. I'm shaking hands, hey, how you doing? I said, Hey, how are you today? Still got to be nice. Yeah. They don't know your son died. Yeah. They don't know. Um got on the plane, uh the lady was like the agent was like, Come on, let's can we take a picture? I said, I said, listen, she didn't know. Yeah. I said, listen, I pulled her to the side because she go to my church in Dallas Friendship West. Okay. I said, I said, I said, listen, I said, my son just passed. I'm trying to make it home. She said, oh my God. I was the last one to get on the plane. She closed the door. But I was the last one to get on the plane. She said, give me your hand. I don't know who that lady was. Mm. All I know is she go to Friendship West and she worked for Southwest Airlines. She squeezed my hand and she prayed for me right then. Yeah. And I mean, she was praying. Yeah. She was praying. She said, you're going to be fine. She said, God got you. I said, yes, ma'am. Got on the plane in the seat that I always, that that it was a sold-out flight. One seat was open. The seat I always sit on Southwest. The first seat 
in the aisle. I sat right there. Wow. Man behind me, black, older black man, just coming from a family reunion. Ricky Smile, I love everything you're doing. I never told him that I just lost my son. He said, I just came from a family reunion. He said, he said just scroll left, look at my, and I'm talking to him, looking at the pictures. That man didn't know what I was dealing with, right? I'm happy for him. I'm happy that he was able to be with his family and he kept my mind occupied. Yeah. Because that was going to be a long one hour and a half flight. Got out the plane, walking through the airport. By the end, I got about 60 messages on my phone. And I'm making it through the airport. Uh, got in the car, three of my uncles, my uncle bro, uncle Shug, uncle Bruce, all of them last name, Smiley, was in the car. They was all in the car and they was crying. And I said, hey, I said, y'all, I said, hey, come on, y'all. I said, we're going to be okay. I said, turn the radio on. I said, you turn the radio on. Turn the radio on. Let's, it, was a, it was the NFL playoff. We got to the house. Miss Pat was crying. People were starting to come to the house. I said, turn the game on. Turn the game on. The NFC playoffs. Just turn the game on. Just where, where it wouldn't feel so heavy. I had to leave. Yeah. Didn't want the sadness. My son came home. My daughter came. And uh, they was watching the game. People started bringing food. Uh, relatives, family members start, starting to come, and it was just calm and peaceful. And I just had to start thinking like, okay, what's the next move? What are we, we gonna do? Me and my kids drove to Atlanta to pay our respects to my son's mother and her husband. And we, as a family, it was me and my kids, it was uh, my son's mother, her husband, and their daughter. And we just sat in the room in a setting just like this and and it, we was crying there was no outside no aunties no it was her her husband and her daughter and me and the rest of my kids yeah it was just us yeah and we planned everything figured everything out and we wanted to be there for her um just out of respect and we made arrangements and and we just did what we had to do yeah so um, that was that was that was a tough one. That's got to be. I mean, literally. I mean, I'm sitting here. I'm tearing up because yeah. to hear a parent, because mm -hmm. no parent wants to bury their child. Yeah. No parent wants that. Um, but you have to think about like, how are you able to cope and lead even in this time, yeah. right? Because grief comes in waves, and we talked yeah. about that before we even got on the air. Like it comes in waves, <laughs> even as you were. It's funny you asked that, Brandy. My son died on a Sunday. They said, the radio station, take, we are sorry for your loss. Take as much time as you need. Take off as much time as you need. Brandon, I was back on the air that Wednesday. Hmm. You know why? Because their kids died also. Hmm. They mama died. My mother's still living. They on the way to dialysis and their kids died. They on the way to chemotherapy and their kids died. You understand? It's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. People wake up every morning and listen to the, the Ricky Smiley Morning Show or the Steve Harvey, Harvey Morning Show uh, are looking for inspiration because of what they're going through. Okay, my son died. My son was 32. But I get to the funeral home. It's some, mother, some people in here who got a 17-year-old back there in the morgue. Right? Mm -hmm. That's going through that. Imagine if if my son was 17, yeah, God gave me an extra 15 years, and that's how I look at it. Thank you, God, I was able to live to see my son be old enough to be 30 years old, 32, almost 33. God gave me that. Yeah. So it's not about me. I had to get back on the radio. I did the morning show that Thursday morning. I got my son clothes together, and I'm headed down to the funeral home. Did the morning show, got his stuff. Socks, underwear, T-shirt, suit. But on the way to the funeral home, I stopped by the Salvation Army to feed the homeless. Yeah, because <clears throat> I wanted to show God that even in the worst time of my life, I still got time to serve. Mm. I wanted to see some homeless people that's coming by just to get a meal. Because mind you, I ate that morning. Mind you, God didn't take my sleep and he didn't take my appetite. 
I got out there and ate breakfast. I sat down and ate a full meal. God let me have an appetite. I'm finna go and serve these homeless people, these hot dogs. We had it was hot dogs, sauerkraut, and some <laughs> chips, and some cake. And yeah. I wanted to look in the eyes of people that, that also going through something and serve them. Yeah. With my son clothes in the car, right? Left there, Salvation Army, and went to the funeral home and took the clothes in there and, and, and got into some more details and did a lot of that stuff where my son's mom wouldn't have to do it. She don't know nothing about wow. burying nobody, yeah. nothing like that. I wanted to try to shield them from a lot of that. It's a lot of stuff I seen, Brandy, that I can't unsee what I saw. You understand? My, my granddaddy was standing right there in the morgue when, when they rolled my dad's body in. And I made sure I was standing right there when they rolled my son in. I saw it all. I took that shit like a G. I took it like a man. And I just went through that. It was something that I had to deal with. And I know there's other people out there that been through worse and seen worse. Yeah. And I had to serve. I had to lead. I had to make sure they had a, a uplifting, uh, standing ovation as uh, my son's mom was so brilliant with that idea. Instead of calling it a funeral or home going service, she called it a standing ovation because he was a comic. Yeah. You know, inspired by your dad, inspired by me, inspired by Martin Lawrence and other companies that he loved. And yeah. he absolutely loved Dave Chappelle. So we wanted to do that for him. Um, um, uh, Leandria came through. Darlene McCoy came through. Leandria, Leandria Johnson. Yeah. And uh, my pastor and other pastors came through. It was an awesome celebration for him. But uh, that was a hard, cold uh, end of January, February. That was the darkest time of my life. It's it was, got to be. It was, I'll never forget it. And I'm not looking forward to February again because I don't know. I, I just don't know how I'm going to feel because coming up on it. Uh, yeah, one year. On, on one year and dealing with the fall and the winter month, I don't know if that's going to be a trigger. But I got, um, how do you pronounce the name? Miss Van Zant. Iyama. Iyama. Iyama Van Zant. Van Zant. This is a, that's a big thing for you. Yeah. And we're going to get together and peel out the layers. Because uh, you're starting therapy. Yeah, you said starting, you're starting, starting therapy. therapy. Yeah. What um, what made you decide this? Because I had to do it because I blocked it out of my, I blocked it out of my, it's like, right, it's like right here. Yeah. Like I'm dealing, I dealing with, I, I know that it happened, but I got it blocked. And I won't, I won't deal with it. I can talk about it. I don't, it's, it's strange. I can talk about it, but I just won't, won't deal with it because uh, my son was 32. But what I see is a happy uh, seven-year-old out there jumping on the trampoline. Hmm. You know, um, the happy seven-year-old is in there making it with his little Eggo waffles and syrup in the morning and and picking them up from Atlanta on the weekends and, you know, watching them go to school when I, you know, when he start going to school in Birmingham and and just having him there at the house and just being with him. Um, I'm thankful, I'm thankful to God that I was able to have the opportunity to live in, under the same roof with him and not just, yeah. you know, for a weekend visitation. I was able to have him live. He spent half his childhood with his mom and half other half of his childhood with me. Yeah. And uh, it was just a blessing. So um, uh, I didn't lose no sleep over decisions that I made as a parent. I didn't do anything wrong. Did you ever question it? Never. Even in those moments? Yeah. Only thing I would have done is probably uh, um, sent them to rehab one more time, but I sent him to rehab the two times that he asked to go. You can't make nobody go to yeah. rehab if they don't want to go. Yeah. Special K got with his mom and they sent him. He came back early. And um, you know, um uh, and then after after that he died. Mm. You know, so um it's like a it's a nightmare. You feel like you have a disease, you're walking around like something is wrong with you. Mm. It's it's like you're different from everybody else. It's like you you have leprosy. Yeah. And and you know what's crazy? Um, I see people, and I can look in their eyes and know that their kids died. Really? It's like the cues. It's almost like you, it's you like feel I, that. Connection. I can look. I can look in the audience of men, and I can look all in the eye, and I know which ones are omegas. Hmm. 
And it's almost like you're walking down a dark road and you see these zombies who eyes lit up in the woods and they're coming closer to the road. Oh, wow. But they're not coming to get you. And you, you recognize them. It's like, I can see them in the audience. They come up to the stage. They have a look in their eyes. And I'd be like, when I see that look, before I can even shake the hand, I say, go to the side, go to the side. And I never get it wrong. Hmm. And they come to the side of the stage. Like, hey, I lost my daughter. I'm like, I know. This is part of your assignment. They're like, how do you know? Yeah. I say, I'm looking at a husband and a wife. I knew they lost their kid. Yeah. They at the show, they like Rick, but they had this sadness in it. I'm looking at both of them. I said, they lost their kid. I said, something wrong with them. I do like that. Wow. Come, come to the side of the stage. Yeah. Get them backstage. Uh, I've been taking a lot of parents out to dinner. Some parents, I might fly out of town to a show just to come be with us, get them a hotel room, wow. just to break it up for them yeah. um, um, or whatever. But I, I, I still thank God, I still give all to God the praise because my son wasn't shot down in an alley or a gas station. Yeah. You know, um, and he didn't die like a dog on the side of the road. But he lost his life to something that really affects so many people. Yeah. Yeah, drug addiction yeah. is that affects no matter the color, no matter mm -hmm. the socioeconomic background, no matter how they were raised, yeah. where they were raised. And I'm not discounting anybody that lost their kids uh, to, to, to fentanyl. Um, uh, it has hit our family three times. I lost a, a nephew and a niece. I had a nephew and my son. I had custody of, of my nephew. He died a year before my son died. Wow. He was a year older than my son. So. And then I had a niece to die in between them. Did you see the vision for your son after your nephew died? Yeah. That's when you saw the That's vision That's when I for saw the, how, how did you know that? That's yeah. crazy. I saw the video of um, my nephew's uh, burial. He had a, a graveside service. I couldn't attend it because my uncle's funeral was at the same time. And when I saw my son there, one of the pallbearers, I, I already knew God had told me that... Um, prepare yourself wow yeah and i feel like god took him because he was suffering yeah uh, he were not able to have access to his daughter uh he was being tortured with that um you know um that really took him i think i believe that was a thing that i had a major off. effect on him that he was yeah. not able to see his daughter um the videos of him going over there ringing the doorbell making an attempt to see his daughter. Um, I went down and paid his attorney fees for him to give him a chance uh, at that uh, to see his daughter. Uh, it was just one of those situations where he didn't have access to his daughter. He had a three-year-old daughter that he loved and he couldn't see her. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think that was one of the, uh, that was hard for him. Yeah. So with this as your new ministry, because I feel like this is a part of your ministry, mm -hmm. your assignment on your life, the calling on your life to help and heal people. Mm -hmm. What's that one piece of advice you would give a parent who has lost their child or one thing that you could say to them? May I stay close to God. Uh, if I never experienced God a day in my life, I experienced him when my son died because uh, that, that's, he kept me. You know, I can't tell you how many times uh, seeing what I saw, I could tell you so much stuff that I saw, Brandy. Yeah. I could really tell you some stuff. I I can't tell you how many nights I wanted to take that 45 sitting up on the edge of my bed and, and end it all. Wow. And then some of the insults that came with the injury. I have been through, through stuff since my son died. And I'm like, it's just, it's too much. And it's almost like you're crawling, man. You just got to keep crawling. You got to, even when you get knocked down, if you can look up, you can get up. Yeah. You got to keep crawling and keep pushing. You got a grandson over here. I got grandkids. I got, I got a son that's getting ready to graduate Alabama State that needs me. My daughters needs me. My mother needs me. You understand? And I have to do it for them. Yeah. Even when I feel like I can't do it for myself, I have to do it for the listening audience who don't have nothing and nobody but the radio yeah. to turn on to every morning to get some inspiration. We open up with a gospel praise break also, you know. Um, so my grandfather lost my dad. My dad was 26. I watched my grandfather take that stuff like a G, sit on that front row and cry. 
it's, 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 it's strange because if I hear any music from the 70s, it wiped me out. I can't listen to Marvin Gaye. I can't listen to the stylistics. I can't wow. listen to none of that stuff because all of the songs that was out when my dad died, I somehow became my grandfather burying his, burying his son. So the music from the 70s kind of confused me. Mm. I get really sad uh, when I hear the OJs or anything because it reminds me of my son's death because I, it seemed like I, God put my body into my grandfather's grandpa. body and those were the songs that was out when my dad died. Yeah. And I'm going through the same thing that my granddad went through and I'm seeing the same thing that he saw. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather and I was close. And my, my grandfather got a picture with your dad, uh, uh, a nice picture with your dad. Uh, uh, your dad was crazy about my grandfather. They had they had some kind of trash talking thing going on. <laughs> Every time he came around, my granddad, my granddad came around Steve, it was just always something. They had some energy uh, that was really funny. Uh, but uh, my grandfather, he dead and gone. He'd been dead five years. Uh, I just hate that he wasn't, uh, well, I'm glad that he's, he wasn't here to, to, to experience that, but I know that he would have made me feel a lot better. Yeah. So I think about my grandparents a lot now because I wish they were here while I'm going through this. Yeah. While yeah. you're going through it. Mm -hmm. Who, Ricky, you have had such, such a life. Yeah. A life. And you still remain out of the spotlight, out of the drama, out of the mess. Mm -hmm. You've remained out of it, you know, in yeah. all of this, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that even when I watched you, you did an interview with Tamara Hall, like right after, I think like maybe like six weeks or so. Was yeah. it like six weeks after? Mm -hmm. And I was, I was in awe of you. Mm -hmm. I was really in awe because I was sitting there like, how is this even possible? How yeah. is this man even mustering up enough to sit on national television to do this? Yeah, you got to you got to make faith. bring awareness to it and try to save as many lives as you can. Yeah, because my mom told me um, my son died so other people could live. Mm. You understand? Yeah, just like Jesus died for us. Yeah, my son died. So other people could live. Yeah, you know, and I don't, I don't understand everything. Um, I'm sure we, are, like the song said, we'll understand it better by and by. But if bringing awareness to what's going on with our drugs and um, fentanyl is taking out so many kids, my pastor, uh, his daughter died, and I was with my pastor uh, sitting in the car waiting on the funeral to start. Mm -hmm. uh, my pastor Kevin Bryant. And I'm just sitting there with him. And I'm sitting in the back seat like I could not imagine what he's feeling right now. And then to have my pat my same pastor stand up there and read the uh, the New Testament at my son's funeral after he lost his daughter mm -hmm. to the same thing. And how things just that came around in full circle. Um it's it's tough, Brandy. I, I don't I don't see how I do it either. Because uh, <clears throat> the um, you know the butterflies, man, they hit my stomach in the middle of the, still to this day. The anxiety. Sometimes they wake up. Sometimes I wake up. It's like. It's like he died all over again. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I can't even, like, I can't, like, is this real? Yeah. Is this my life? <clears throat> no amount of happiness, no amount of boating, no amount of swimming, no amount of, and then my grandson, seven years old, remind, remind me of Brandon so much because he liked the same thing that Brandon liked teaching him how to swim. Uh, he loved the Waffle House. Brandon loved the Waffle House. <laughs> and it's like, he just reminded me so much of Brandon. They yeah. like the same thing. Yeah. And uh, Brandon was crazy about uh, Grayson. Um, I just, I'll never forget it. Uh, Miss Janie, um, it was like a, a slow moving black and white nightmare. You know. Um, I just hate it. I I I just hate it. I hate that <laughs> that that people that that it was that my son's death was a trigger for other people who have lost kids. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you, you're thinking about all of that stuff. You're always thinking about other people, other people, other people. You think, you know, uh, yeah, you're going through stuff, but you're always just trying to have some self-awareness and think about how all of this is affecting other people. So if my son's death is a trigger for other people, let me try to be open and have a conversation about it to hopefully save other lives. Yeah. And I would just tell kids, like, man, you know, uh, it started out with weed. It started out with drinking. Don't do any of it. You know, I saw I saw my grandparents on that front row crying at my dad's funeral. I knew right then that day, at at six, almost seven years old, that I wasn't finna do none of it. I don't care what nobody say or think. To hell with it. I'm not drinking, smoking, nothing. Your father passed of my dad. Yes, I ain't. Wow, your father passed of drugs. Wow. My grand my grandfather was standing right there inside of that morgue when they brought my dad's body bag in from New York. My granddaddy told, he told me about it. And me and my grandfather had a bun. My grandfather took whatever insurance money he had on my dad and raised me with it. Wow. And my grandfather was able to see all of my success. And I believe that God is going to allow me to have that same experience with my grandkids. Because we were really close. Absolutely. My grandfather came to Dallas with me every summer when I was on 97.9 to beat. My grandfather went to the radio station with me every morning. Yeah. Sat in there and had his coffee, you know. And uh just to be able to make to make it up, to make up for what my grandfather went through. I I I, I wanted to make it good for him. Yeah. I wanna make this good for you. I wanna show you something that you mm -hmm. didn't get to see with your son. Yeah. But since you raised me, here you go. Yeah. And um um uh, I was able to uh to make my grandfather smile and make up for what he had been through. And I hope that, I believe that God is going to honor that for me, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. 1,000%. I hope so. 1,000%. 1,000%. Ricky, I am so grateful that you have been so open to have this conversation with me. Mm -hmm. You Thank know, you. seriously, because I know how personal this is, mm -hmm. how emotional it can be. Um, and really my prayer for you is that you continue to walk in faith, but that you seek the help that you need in this season. Because no matter where we are, no matter how much pressure we got to lead other people, mm -hmm. we still got to take that time to fill up our own cup. Absolutely. You know, and I just want you to be pouring out of a full cup, you know, yeah. giving folks the stuff that's on the salsa, not the stuff that's, you know. Yeah. Because you give into everybody every single day. Right. You know, you give so much. Yeah. Well, it's happening, Brandy, and I'm, I'm excited about it. I look forward to the, the help and the therapy. The crazy thing about it, I got therapy for everybody. I got everybody in the family going to therapy, and I, I, I just, just, just wasn't ready to deal with it. But now, you're ready. I'm ready. And that's when you go. You yeah. go when you're ready. Yeah. You cannot be forced into that because yeah. you're not gonna get out of it what you got to get out of it. Right. And so now that you are ready for it, mm -hmm. you're gonna be open all the little stuff. You're gonna start unfolding all the stuff. You're gonna start unpacking. It's mm -hmm. gonna be so good. Yeah. You're gonna be losing a whole lot of folks coming up now. Like some folks gonna be coming about your life. You're gonna be having some extra boundaries now. Absolutely. You know, you're gonna be having some extra boundaries. Yeah. So as we close out. What is Ricky Smiley committed to in this season? What are you committed to? Uh, well, yeah, again, therapy, uh, happiness, um, committed to, um, you know, my radio show, um, uh, my little podcast that I'm running, and I'm doing a Netflix special, and I'm writing a book. I'm so excited for this. Yeah. Yes. I'm excited about the Netflix special uh, uh, that's coming out, directed by David and Lynn Talbert. Wow. So I'm excited about that. You got that. some good writers that you're working with on this too, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, Chris Spencer, uh, Rita Brenner's been helping me out. Uh, uh, some other comedians kind of, kind of helping me punch up my material, yeah, or whatever. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, Cause I, have, I haven't, yeah, the return Lil of Little Daryl's coming back. Little Daryl's coming back, <laughs> or whatever. Cause I hadn't done a special since the, you know, the BET, the bass guitar. Really? I do that. Yeah, what no, year was that? That? Boy, that was about ten years ago. That was ten years. I ago. I haven't done a special in ten years, and I was always doing a comedy special on Comedy Central and BET, or whatever. But the last one was on BET, so. uh I'm excited to show you that I still got it. I just sold out the uh, MGM yeah. in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And the night before that, I was in Atlantic City at the Horace Casino. Yeah. I love doing those casinos, by the way. Uh, so uh, I'm excited about my career. It's simple. No, 
No TV shows, no movies. You know, I'll go and make an appearance on a TV show. Yeah. In a movie or whatever. But I don't want to sit in a trailer all day. That's not my thing. And uh, why don't you do more? Why don't I do more pushing my kids, the grandkids, grandkids yes. on, on swings? swings. Yes. I got a little bad nine-month-old granddaughter <laughs> named Denver who got a lot of energy. And uh, she bad. Boy, she's spicy. <laughs> I got a spicy little nine-month-old. And I'm enjoying that. And yeah. that's life. Yeah. That's life. That's life. That's life. Ricky Smiley, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Brandy. Listen, this was a whole, we did all the things. We we did all the things. <laughs> we didn't laugh, we didn't cry, we didn't set it out a little bit. Yeah. Y'all, thank my you My first so, Q Delta, thank you for my first Q Delta this interview. This is some real common love, you know Come on what I'm now. saying? This is a whole situation. Come on I now. just celebrated 20 years. What? You just celebrated 23 years. Come on now. So, you know, we OGs <laughs> out here. Like, we all now, look at us. So, look, my cousin, I want to thank my cousin for stopping by. This felt like a good family catch up i am so excited to have ricky smiley on the show you guys be sure to subscribe like subscribe comment share but most of all bring yourself right back to vault empowers until next time you guys eat well give a damn move your body every single day peace